it is Father's Day. And I was just thinking this week about one crazy fact is that I have now been a dad for almost 17 years. And so here's the problem with that. I still have no idea what I'm doing. No clue, no idea. And every time I think I get it figured out, I mean, I got a, a son who's almost 17, uh, a daughter who's 13 going on 36. And so I'm trying to catch up. And every time I think I understand how to be a dad, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. They grow up, they get older, they get a new job or like a girlfriend or, a, or like a new hobby or a new thing that they're doing. Or they get taller than me. And I'm like, how do you deal with that? And he's constantly saying, I can beat you. And I'm like, you'll never be able to beat me. And this is the ongoing conversation that we have. I have no idea what I'm doing as a dad. Is anybody with me? Anybody with me? Okay, cool. Just so I know I'm in a good club, you guys who didn't raise your hand, you're liars. You're liars or you're not fathers. So those are the only two options there. Um, the thing is, it's gotten a lot easier for us recently, though, as parents, because my, parent, my kids have gotten better about fighting. <sighs> they've gotten better. They're not, like, cured of it, but they've gotten better. Is it just me or do your kids, like, argue and bicker and complain and fight? Yeah, okay, so it's like, it's a consistent thing. It was so bad at one point in my life that I just completely dreaded going on any road trip with my family. I just couldn't stand it because I was afraid that I might commit murder. And here, this is why. Like, I mean, it's a very practical reason because you can't fight if there's only one of you. And so I'm not going to say the, cross, the thought actually crossed my mind, but man, it's like, would you guys just stop it? Just stop. This is it's a big back seat. Like, can you just stop? So they got better. It's so bad. But if you have had a sibling in your life, you understand. It's a rite of passage. Like, you get to fight with your sibling. If you didn't fight with your sibling, it's probably because they're like 12 years older than you or younger than you. Like, that's the only way. And so it makes me think, God bless my mama. <laughs> and my mom, man, I have a brother. I've told lots of stories about my, my brother Jason. He's also a preacher, and he was here one day, just roasted me. He's pretty good from stage. It was awesome. And uh, like, but I think I personally owe my mom and dad a big apology, and I've given it to them many times, for being difficult, especially in when it came to conflict with my brother, because we would go at it. I'll get, I've told lots of stories, I, so I can't remember which one I've told before, so I'll tell some of my favorites. Um, my favorite is probably one time we were in the backyard, we were arguing over something, and he was like 10 feet away from me, and so I just raised our BB gun and just shot him. Bam! He was like, ah! I think it was like eight years old. And uh, you guys aren't laughing hard enough, because this was a good moment in my life. I shot my brother, and then he's like, ah, I'm going to tell mom. I'm like, no, 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 don't tell mom, don't, no. I got an idea, don't tell mom. So what I do, I take the BB gun, and I shoot myself right in the foot. <laughs> it's logical, okay, because I'm like, now you can't tell mom because I got shot, and you got shot, we're even, right? That little punk, he went right inside and told mom that I shot him, and I shot myself. I got in trouble twice. Like, why'd you shoot yourself, idiot? So there's that. Uh, I remember one time. Uh, we, were, we were wrestling, playing, and I, w I had a, a, a temper issue, and I took some of these big, um, like, haircutting scissors. It's like Floyd the Barber, full-on steel scissors, and I threw them at him like a ninja star. And he was sitting on his bed, and they stuck in the headboard beside his face, and I immediately turned my life over to Jesus and <laughs> got baptized, and I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Like, I was terrified. I really, I, you know, you, you act in the heat of passion, and then you immediately regret that. Oh, man, we were wrestling. We were fist fighting. We were going at it. That was just, but that was, that's life. And here's the thing. If you grew up with a sibling, I, I want to tell you something. You were preparing yourself for the rest of your life. Being with people in conflict is the rest of your life. Do you have neighbors? Do you have a spouse? Do you have children? Do you have coworkers? Do you exist in a world with other human beings, billions of them? Are there people who vote for different people than you vote for? Then yeah, you're familiar with conflict. And so today what I want to do is talk about what Jesus has to say about our conflict with other people. We're in this teaching series called Salt and Light, and it's a teaching series through the Sermon on the Mount, which is, uh, if you've got a Bible, you can go ahead and grab it. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 again today. The Sermon on the Mount is in the book of Matthew, which is a biography of the life of Jesus. And in chapters 5, 6, and 7, he goes over what is basically like his opus sermon. And so for several chapters, for three chapters, he just goes over like, there are some people that say this is everything you need to know about life. I don't know that that's completely true, but it's a lot. It's a lot of good stuff, and it's like all one big sermon. And so we're spending the whole summer going through the Sermon on the Mount. And this week we're in chapter 5, starting in verse 38, if you want to get there. If you don't have a Bible, we've got free ones we give away by the door. Feel free to grab one or look it up on your phone. The scripture I'm reading will be on the screen as well. I've said that uh, we're going to have... Um, 
We want to be a church that takes notes and bring your Bible. So I want to encourage you this summer, be a church that brings your Bible, takes notes, because this is, I mean, it's yours to learn. It's yours to internalize. It's not mine to give you. It's yours to work with. And so take time with it this week. But as we've been studying through this, what we find in the last chapter, we're only in chapter five, Jesus has actually addressed conflict in a number of ways. And I don't know if you noticed it. I didn't even notice it until I was doing this sermon and looked back. Like, for example, in the very first section of the Sermon on the Mount, starting in verse, uh, you know, one and two, three, it keeps on going. It's a list of the be attitudes and ways that you should be. I've said they were the attitudes you should be. That's how I remember it. And among the be attitudes are this. um, Be a peacemaker. Be merciful. Be humble. Are they not ways to deal with conflict? That's how we should treat people, right? So there it is. Uh, Later, he talks about treating people better than they deserve, in the next section, there's this huge issues that he deals with. We talked about murder and anger, adultery, lust, and divorce. That was a fun week. Living a life of integrity. You might remember last week, uh, Greg was here, and he talked about let your yes be yes, let your no be no. That's all about integrity. And what better way to manage our conflict with people than to understand how we react in those scenarios? And so really, a lot of what Jesus is telling us goes back to what he says is part of the greatest commandment, which is to love other people as yourself. Love your neighbor. God's no stranger to our conflict, and he understands that we have a hard time with people. He's teaching us that we are to be different in this world. There is a natural way to respond to conflict. In fact, I would say there's kind of two ends of the spectrum, and you probably can identify yourself. This is, there's so many personality tests out there, and all of them kind of will tell you this part. Uh, the first way people deal with conflict is they avoid it. There's conflict over here, and I'm out. I don't want to confront you. I don't want to deal with it. You could talk smack to me, to my face, and I will just turn away and walk away, and I will cry in my sleep because I don't want to deal with conflict. That's, that's one spectrum, one end of the spectrum. On the other end, can you guess what it is? Y- you dive in like the kid at the pool party. You're like, yoo-hoo, cannonball. You're like, conflict, bring it on, and you're like throwing blows, and you're the one starting the conflict half the time. And so it's like those are the spectrums, and here's the thing. Those are natural ways to respond to conflict. Think about like animals in nature. I mean, some animals, when the predator comes, they hide in a hole because that's how they can respond to conflict. They can't deal with it. Other animals will attack head on and protect their, their territory and stuff like that. It's natural. It's natural to respond this way. But I think there's a third way that we can respond. And I think this is what Jesus is touching on as he continues in the Sermon on the Mount today, starting in verse 38. It, I think the third way is, an, is not a natural way. It's what I'm going to call a supernatural way. It requires the help of God for us to do it (laughs) because we're not going to respond the way that we naturally want to. I had a friend, this is a total side note. You can talk to me about this later if you want to, but I had a friend this past summer, last summer, and he heard someone say the word supernatural, and he said, I hate the word supernatural. This guy is a very learned, he's a missionary in, uh, in East, Eastern Europe, he's multilingualist, he works for Pioneer Bible Translators, smart, smart guy. He said, I don't like the word supernatural. I said, why not? He said, because there's no such thing. I was like, yeah, there is. He goes, no, I mean, God made it, and that's all there is. It's not like he made two existences. I, that's just more philosophical than theological, but I was like, that's a good point. But we're going to use the word supernatural here today, because we're going to need God's help We're going to need God's help because we like to hide and we like to fight. So let's see what Jesus has to say. We're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Jesus starts like this. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Pause right there. You can just leave it on the screen. So once again, this is part of the Old Testament code. And so many times throughout this sermon, Jesus says, you have heard it was said. Do this, do this, do this. Generally, he's referring to something in the Old Testament. And uh, actually, this phrase, this is a pretty well understood phrase. Like, almost all cultures across all time have used this. And this actually predates Mosaic Code. It's from Hammurabi's legal code. I mean, if you know the history stuff, I see a lot of you shaking your head. The others, don't worry, it's on YouTube. It's before the Law of Moses was even written. It is just a basic standard of respect. And it says this, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You hit me. I should be able to hit you. Things should be fair. Now we're even, now it's over. That's why I shot myself in the foot with the BB gun. It's Hammurabi's code. Moses liked it. God liked it. It's not ungodly. It's not terrible. But he says this. You have heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. In fact, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you, 
and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Man, so what Jesus is talking about here is so big. Jesus, one thing I've noticed about Christians is that we, I'm, I'm going to broad stroke paint Christians, okay? So I don't like to do that because we're not all the same. I'm confident of that. We all have the same Lord, but we respond to the world differently. One thing I've noticed on a grand scale, though, is how angry Christians get about stuff. We just get angry. I mean, we will throw a fit, and we will boycott you so fast, and we will shut you down, and we will tell you that you're going to hell because we're angry. And I get it. There's righteousness, and we've talked. There's actually a whole sermon on anger uh, a couple weeks ago in this series. Go check it out on our podcast or, uh, or on our YouTube. We've got a, a, a playlist for every sermon series. And there is a place for that. There's a place for righteous indignation. There's a place where we should say, someone's going against the holiness of God. I need to stand up for that. But sometimes, though, we take that and we put ourselves on this pedestal, and we're like, how dare you? Do you know who I am? <laughs> and we just puff our chests chest out and... This isn't about the emotion of anger, okay? You can feel angry about something. What Jesus is talking about is our, our response. Like, not just how do I feel, but what do I do? What words do I say? What do I do with my hands or my BB gun? <laughs> what, do I, what do I do because of the way you've made me feel? And so you can read about this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth rule, uh, Exodus, if you're a note taker, Exodus 21 and verse 24, Deuteronomy 19, verse 21. And this is just some of the places where some of that code is talked about. And God's all for it. He's like, listen, things should be fair. You should deal with things. There's, there's, a, there's a way to do with this. But Jesus says, here's what we're going to do. As Christians, we're going to raise the bar. And this is kind of my summary of Jesus' statement. Basically, kindness will transcend retribution. Just let that sink in. Kindness will transcend or rise above or be more valuable, more important, more powerful than our retribution, or, or our desire to strike back. You hit me, I'm not going to hit you. Instead, I'm going to treat you with kindness. And this is all sprinkled throughout the Old Testament as well. There's this concept. My grandma used to say, did you ever hear this phrase, that you should, you should be kind and it will, it will heap burning coals upon their head? And I was like, grandma, that doesn't sound kind at all. <laughs> but what it means is like when you, it, you maybe you've heard this phrase, kill them with kindness. Okay, so if you're really nice to someone and they're being mean to you, it de-escalates things. And there, there's a point at which they're like, actually, I, I'm actually just being a bully right now. But if you meet them where they are, then you are just continuing to elevate it. And so Jesus says, listen, kindness will transcend retribution. And so he gives us a couple of examples. Uh, and this is a classic thing. He gives us three things. The slap, he gives us the shirt, he gives us the mile. The slap, the shirt, the mile. Okay, so I want to break these three down because these are very specific things to this first century Jewish culture, but I think they overlap to who we are today as well. Let's just talk about all three of them. Uh, first of all, the slap. Uh, as in many cultures, um, you know, the slap is a form of disrespect. Okay, and so I think of the cartoons with some cartoon that's like got a French accent, and he's like, I slap you in the face, and he's got this glove, and he's slapping. I, I don't know. I think that's like... I don't think French people actually do that, but I do think it gets the point across that when we feel offended, I'm going to slap you in the face. In American culture, we don't do the physical slap quite so often. We actually take, uh, we, we take like, like shots below the belt in terms of like words that we use against each other. We will attack people on social media. We're very passive aggressive and we use sarcasm. We mask, we mask our slaps in sarcasm. And we take shots at people. But this is the whole idea of the slap. And I want to give you a category of what I think this kind of covers. This is like person-to-person -person conflict. So i got a problem with you, my neighbor. I've got a problem with you, my boss or my coworker. i got a problem with you, my spouse or my child, whatever it is. And I don't know how to deal with this, so I'm going to slap you. I might physically do it. I might verbally do it. I might do it by ignoring you. I might do something. But I'm going to take action against you. This is probably a conflict that you face more often than any other conflict. It's the neighbor who keeps letting their dog use the bathroom in your yard. I got several neighbors who have so many signs in their yard that talk about people letting their dogs. I'm like, that's how you want to decorate your yard. Like, you're so upset about, but that's, that's how they want to do it. They want to fight back the neighborhood by putting more signs in their yard that say, don't let your dog use the bathroom in my yard. It might be for you, the coworker that hurt your feelings. It might be for you, uh, I mean, someone you live with. It might be a family member. It might be a friend that has hurt you. And Jesus says, listen, 
I know this sounds crazy. And the natural reaction is to slap them back, but I want you to do the supernatural thing. I want you to just stand there and take it. In fact, he suggests turning the other cheek. And there's actually a whole other cultural thing about left hand, right hand slapping. There's a clean hand and an unclean hand. I'm not going to even get into all that. Because our American culture, all you need to know is this. Jesus is saying if someone does you wrong, the supernatural response to conflict is that you just stand there and take it. In fact, you just let them. I need to give a side caveat here. Jesus is not advocating abuse. This is not abuse. This is not someone being taken advantage of, someone in two different stations, and one somebody exercising authority over someone else and being abusive, okay? We understand abuse. We live in a very abuse-conscious culture, so don't even hear Jesus saying that. He's saying if you're with a peer and they treat you wrong, you don't slap them back. And that's probably what a lot of our dads told us to do. <laughs> if they hit you first... You give them the last hit, and then they hit the ground. There's two more hits. I hit you, you hit the ground. You ever hear that? Yeah. Jesus is like, Nyeh. that's not how we deal with things in the kingdom of God. Jesus' words, not mine. I'm just telling you about it. That's the slap. Second was the, third, the shirt. The shirt. Okay, this one's a little uh, simpler than the slap. It's also a little bit weird. It's about kind of a legal conflict. So that was person to person. This is maybe a legal conflict. So there was this cultural thing back in the day, like if someone was going to sue you, they would take from you a collateral to make sure that you would show up at court or that you would follow through with this whole conversation. And so the easiest thing for them to take for you might be your shirt. That seems like a strange thing to take, but I want you to go back to the first century in a culture where you don't have a lot of things, especially not a huge wardrobe. So what's a very valuable thing you have? Your clothes. And so I'm going to give you the shirt off my back. That's actually kind of a phrase that we use too. They would give you the shirt off his back. And so you get, you get the shirt and you give it to him. He said, listen, there's this legal expectation that a collateral of your shirt could be taken. Okay, that's fine. Don't deny them the shirt. In fact, go ahead and give them the coat as well. Okay, so if you don't have any shirts, you definitely don't have any coats or cloaks. This is your outer garment. In fact, if you gave someone the shirt, you could still close up the outer garment. If you've seen any old Christmas plays, you know, and it's a bunch of kids wearing their dad's bathrobes, like picture this. It's like an, a bigger robe on top of a smaller tunic. And Jesus says, listen, don't just give them the shirt. Give them your outer coat as well. Now, this is one of the most valuable things a lot of people even owned. And what it says is this. It's kind of what, what Greg was saying last week. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Tell them, like, listen, you want my shirt because you don't think I'm going to follow through on this? My character is way more valuable than my possessions. Fine. You, if you need something to prove that you can trust me, take it all. Just take my coat, too. Same thing. It's like giving them the other cheek. The person goes, because oh, what are they likely to say? No, 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 no. You don't have to give me it. No, take it. No, you don't have to give me it. No, take it. You don't have to give it. Oh, you wanted my shirt a minute ago. I want you to take the coat too. Now, you got to be careful with the passive aggressive, you know, stuff behind that. It's just like, no, seriously. I, I'm offended that you think my character is not valuable enough, <laughs> that I wouldn't show up at court. I want you to know I will be there for this coat. That's the shirt. There's a lot that Christians could talk about in legal dealings, and I don't even know that that's the point of this whole teaching for Jesus. I mean, there's this whole thing that among Christians, we really shouldn't be taking each other to court, uh, because what does that look like to outsiders? Like, you guys, you Christians, you claim to have, like, this better way of life, but you can't even deal with each other without going to the courts. You know, that, that's less in the Bible, also just Jesus' words. But the whole idea is, like, we need to be people of such integrity that people will know that they can trust us, and we will go that extra step and give them the cloak as well. Jesus wants us to value our character of, of peacemaking and kindness way more than we value our possessions. So there's the slap, there's the shirt, and now the third one, the mile, the mile. Um, so we've dealt with personal conflict, we've dealt with some legal conflict with people, but now let's talk about the government, because it's my favorite thing to talk about from this stage. I, don't, I won't do it, it's a waste of all of our time. Um, but... Have you heard conflict within the government? Anybody, any whisperings? Or I mean, I don't know if you've heard something. There's some government stuff, okay? Uh, if you think we've got it bad, you should try being a Jew that lived in the first century, occupied by Romans. It was rough, okay? And so remember who he's talking to here. This is the people who hated their government. There were sects of their people who were actively trying to kill government officials and soldiers. Americans would flip out over what they had to do. There was a custom, a law, that said if a Roman soldier came to you a subject, they could come to you and say, carry all my stuff. Like, so you're a Roman soldier, you might have like a backpack with all your food and stuff in it. You might have some heavy armor or some swords or something, I don't know. Just put it all on you. 
And there was a law that said that if he asked you to do that, you had to carry it for one mile. He couldn't ask you to carry it for more than a mile, but he, you couldn't tell him no for one mile. And if you said no, they could beat you up. Like, okay, so that's not liberty. <laughs> that's not freedom, but it was the law. And Jesus says, if someone asks you to carry something one mile, carry it for them two miles. This isn't just about customer service. Service with a smile. Go the extra mile. And we, we use this phrase in a trite manner. Like, just do it a little bit better. No, Jesus is like, listen, even when people are oppressing you, you take the high road. And it's not natural. None of us want to do that. But the kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom where we act differently to the world around us. We don't respond on Facebook the way that other people respond on Facebook. We don't rant and throw a fit and make a fool of ourselves. I love my, my son works at the Chick-fil-A up on Market Street, and his boss has this phrase, when people, when people are just like acting a fool at a, at a, have you ever been to a fast food restaurant and somebody just decides to throw a fit like a child? Like, I want more ketchup. I don't know what you're upset about. And so he will say to grown people all the time, okay, let's just settle down. Let's act our age. That's what he says to grown-ups. I love it. I love it. And he does it in such a kind way. He's a good Christian man. Let's act our age. But guys, let's, la- let's act our age. What Jesus wants us to do when the outside world sees us is that even when the government is evil and against our morals and our principles and what we want to do, he says, you carry it the extra mile. Does he say compromise your morals? No. Does he say go against God and live an unholy life? No. But as it's in reason, you show them we're a people who can take it. And we're people who will love first. You show kindness first. That's the mile. Again, Jesus isn't advocating abuse. He's just saying, look, we take the high road every time. And it's not natural. That's why it takes supernatural help. That's why it takes accepting Jesus as your Savior. This is a big part of the salvation process When we accept Jesus as our Savior, Scripture says that when we're baptized into Christ, we're given the gift of his Holy Spirit, okay? His Holy Spirit coming to live in us, that's where we get that extra help from. And even if you haven't accepted Christ yet, his Spirit is around us everywhere. It's the presence of God. But when he moves into our life, I've explained it like a a roommate moving in with us, taking up residence in our soul with us. I don't know how it works, but like he's got bunk beds now. We rearrange our life to match him being there. And then when we're weak and we don't know what to do and we don't know how to respond, we can lean on that. We can pray. We can ask ourselves, how did Jesus respond in the face of conflict? And let's look at the rest of what he says because he's not done. (laughs) Verse 43, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I need to clarify. This is not from the law of Moses. This is the one place I think, I I, I wasn't able to find this anywhere else in the Bible, and this is just like, yeah, some people have said this. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. After all, he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, hey, You ain't special. You live on the same planet Earth as everybody else with the same God. You've had failings just like they have. You might not be getting along with them right now, but they have the same God that you do, even if they're not honoring him. 46, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So he gets right to the point. And i got to remind you, he's talking to a first century Jewish audience. No people group in history has been persecuted and mistreated more than the Jewish people. And it predates this moment. Thousands of years before, they were mistreated, kicked around, been mean to, enslaved. Jesus is talking to these people. He's talking talking to a group of people who very soon will become Christ followers Many of them who will be persecuted for their faith, put to death for their beliefs by their enemies. It's almost as if Jesus is just getting ahead of the situation saying, listen, it ain't going to be easy following me. If you thought it was going to be easy, someone didn't explain it to you well. People are going to be against this. And we don't lash out at them. We love them 
and we pray for them. And that's what we do. And that's hard to hear. (laughs) If you love people who love you, what good does that do? Don't the tax collectors and the pagans do that? Yeah. And then he says this last phrase, and and this is like, it seems um, unattainable, but it actually is more attainable than you think. That phrase, let's see if we can put that back up there. Do not eat, oh, sorry, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, You think about perfection, and you're just like, perfect. I mean, I can't be perfect. We have a very loved phrase, nobody's perfect. (laughs) That's how we can justify anything. Nobody's perfect. I love the word perfect uh, in the original Greek as it was written here. It has a couple different understandings and definitions, and and probably a more common understanding for the word perfect is actually complete or mature. So let's rephrase that. Be complete or mature as your heavenly Father is complete or mature. The idea of perfection is like you're doing the best that you can do. You've attained your highest self, maybe the best version of you that you can be. That's a phrase that we use. Be complete and mature as your heavenly Father is complete and mature. And let me show you how he did it, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus set the bar on loving his enemies. There are places in scriptures that said we were enemies to Christ and enemies to the cross. And when we live opposed to him, when we're living in sinfulness, we are enemies to God. But God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He never turns his back on us. He never hides in the hole. He says, I will forgive you. I will give you grace. I will give you abundant life. I will heal you. I will help you. I will restore you. I will put you back together. And then when you get to that healed and restored state, what I want you to do, what I want you to do is I want you to reflect my goodness into the world because people need to see that this is possible. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He asks us to love people who hurt us. It's not a natural reaction. He asks us to love our enemy and pray for those who persecute us. It's not a natural reaction. But it requires a supernatural response. A few years ago, um, I shared this illustration, so you might have noticed these up here. And I almost didn't do it, because I don't like to repeat myself, but uh, also I forget the things I say anyway, so I'm sure you do. Um, so if you see these and you recognize them, you're like, aha, there are the buckets. I remember the buckets. What were the buckets about? I'm about to tell you. Listen, every day you wake up and leave your house with two buckets. Aren't they pretty? My wife bought them at Walmart for me this morning because I forgot. You have two buckets. One is full of gas, one is full of water. Every day you're going to encounter conflict. And the way you respond to that conflict, and there is only one way, is by using one of these buckets. You can either pour gas on the fire, or you can do what you can do to de-escalate the situation. Gas, de-escalate. Notice I didn't say solve. You don't always put the fire out. Ask the poor firefighters that are out in Brunswick County right now trying to figure out what's going in that forest fire. I mean, it's not always a perfect situation, but you can do your best to de-escalate. So every day you leave your house with two buckets, every day you're going to experience conflict, and every time you experience conflict, you're going to use a bucket. Which one will you use? My question for you this morning is, which one is your default bucket? Are you one to pour gas on it? Stop it. Stop it, it's not helping anybody. It's not helping you. The only thing that helps when you pour gas on the fire, the only thing it does is burn people, burn yourself, burn extra people who aren't even involved sometimes. This is natural. (laughs) This is supernatural because this isn't just water. Jesus says that he is the living water, a spring of living water from which we can drink and never get thirsty. It's in the book of John. And it takes some time to fill this bucket. You kind of come, this is stocked. Um, you ever seen a baby? I mean, psh, they come with that. <laughs> this takes practice. It takes diligence. It takes community. It takes decisions. You might not know what water to pour on, but you don't have to slap. You might not know what water to pour on, but you don't have to keep your shirt you don't know what water to pour on, but you don't have to refuse to walk the mile. 
You can take the first steps that you can take. And then you learn over time to tap into God's power in your life. You learn from his word. You learn from his examples. You learn from being in Christian community and sitting with people across the table. The biggest growth I've had in my life has been sitting across from coffee tables with any number of you <laughs> and just talking. How did you do this? How did I do that? Wow. And I guarantee you, every one of you taught me something about how to fill this bucket. And so, what's your default bucket? And how can you go from a place of pouring fire, pouring gas, to, to pouring the living water? Um, I just want to close this out with a challenge today. And I, I don't know... Another way to say this, it came to me, and maybe it's helpful for you. This is our challenge. The challenge this week is this. We've got to learn to be a firefighter, not a people fighter. Because it occurred to me that a lot of times when we see conflict, what we see is problems with people. And the last thing that I've got to leave you with and remind you with is that your problem is not with those people. The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians, he says, our battle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers and the powers and the authorities of, of evil in the heavenly realms. Spiritual forces of darkness. Now, that might make me sound like a crazy person, but man, these are forces that Jesus openly talked about and fought. They are the things that pull our world away from God. And the reason we need his Holy Spirit in our life, because that's the only power in this earth that's strong enough to make it through all of that other conflict. Your struggle is not with that neighbor. It's not with your kids. It's not with your spouse. It's not with your coworker. It's a spiritual struggle, and the only way to de-escalate that spiritual struggle is to be filled with the living water of God's goodness. You get that by being in his word, by be regularly meditating and praying, by growing just by being like that. You get better at it. If you don't feel like you're good at it, congratulations. I've been a dad for 17 years and still have no idea what I'm doing. I've been a Christian for much longer and still struggle every day. But God's grace is sufficient. Because he demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while I was still a sinner, he gave his life for me and for you. And so how do we be salt and light? Well, we put down the gas can, and we learn to carry the living water. The slap, the shirt, the mile, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Be salt and light. Let's pray.